It has been a wonderful week and weekend in the life of our church. Yesterday culminated weeks and months of preparation for something we do here that sets us apart, that brings us together, that serves our community and world, our Haitian mission at Exhale. So many people uh, gave sacrificially, and, and it was just a joy to see. And last night when I learned that we made $46,500, I was filled with emotion. Because all of a sudden, God allowed me to see some of the faces of the people that you, that we, will serve in Haiti and here. Could we praise God for what happened during these weeks? So many snippets of versions of dialogue between our church members and the people we were serving. Um, one kindergarten teacher said, oh, thank you so much for doing this. I've been able to furnish my classroom. Wow. So many ethnicities represented here. So many wonderful words and, um, and communication and relationships begun. Seeing families who, who don't have what you and I, many of us have and able to come here and purchase things that they can't purchase anywhere else. Please don't ever stop doing this, one said to me. And to many of you, the same things were shared. So, so thank you. It was a great time for fellowship in our church. I feel like I can't miss a minute of it. Thank you for welcoming our community into our church. That's who we are at Providence. And thank you for what's going to do with the funds that that you, that we raised for mission. Well, would you bow with me? Lord, we feel you in our midst. We thank you for uh, our tremendous leadership in this, in this attic sale endeavor. Thank you too for members of our community who you blessed and for so many of us who are blessed by our community and use our gifts to serve the poor. Guide us even again to your word this morning that it might transform our lives. It's in the name of Christ that we offer this prayer. Amen. I love questions children ask. Not long ago, one of our six-year-olds asked me a hard one. Pastor Dave, who created God? It's a wonderful question, but actually, it's not that hard to answer. God always was. It's hard for us to make sense of that, but our concept of time isn't ultimate reality for God. God created time as we know it. God always was, even before time. If there are little ones in your life, you're used to questions like that. Another question asked by children is, where is God? That's a question every parent has to try to answer at least once. And it seems like there should be a standard answer, a kind of pat answer. The interesting thing is that children aren't the only people to ask, where is God? You and I ask it too. We ask it when a family dog mauls a child to death, as occurred this past week. We ask it when hurricanes destroy property and take lives indiscriminately. Normally, I do not watch television or listen to things in the morning before I come be with you. I, I want my mind and heart only on what God wants us to talk about today. But, but I couldn't keep myself from turning on the news this morning and seeing what's happening in Houston, Galveston. And my heart was broken as yours when seeing even before light their families coming out of their house wading in chest deep water to find a place of higher ground or another roof to get on. No doubt they were asking where, 
where is God in all of this? We ask, where is God when a driver of a van takes his vehicle off course and kills uh, in the teens number of victims in a place like Barcelona, or when a suicide bomber makes it through security checkpoints and murders civilians? Where was God was asked the last time I was in Bulgaria, 2014. The most powerful storms I've ever experienced began there on a Thursday night before I was to preach twice in our Bulgarian Methodist Church in Mysia, Bulgaria, on Sunday morning. Rains came again on Friday. The small river there in Mysia began to rise. But by Saturday morning, the storms were gone. The sun shone brilliantly. Townspeople were drawn to the river to see it cresting. The banks of the river couldn't be seen. Sunday morning, I preached two different sermons in two different worship services at our Bulgarian Methodist Church there. Following worship, my team and I said goodbye until the next visit from the United States, and then we loaded up into a van to travel to another city for lunch. On our way out of town, Bulgarian police were closing roads, forcing us to take an alternative route to Vojvodo where a meal was already prepared for us. We wondered if the blockade had something to do with rising waters somewhere. Not long after we left Mizia, dams broke upstream and a wall of water more than 12 feet high slammed into that little town, destroying home after home, including the church in which we had just worshiped washed completely away, along with its gardens that fed people in the town and livestock. I had just played with rabbits who were housed under the church, not as pets, but as food for the town. And all the chickens, their parish too. Human lives were lost, along with thousands of head of livestock in a culture where most people live on a subsistence level with little room for loss and no buffer zone between bare necessities and starvation. So where was God? It's a relevant question. It's an interesting sidelight that though the world's cultures seem increasingly secular, when something goes wrong, the search is on for God. From 1980 until 1995, cartoonist Gary Larson captivated many of us. He still does. He's not still drawing. With his cartoon called The Far Side. I'll never forget the cartoon called God at His Computer. It showed God with long white hair and a beard watching a computer screen where an unlucky looking fellow is walking down a sidewalk with a piano suspended by a cable over his head. God's hand is on the computer keyboard and his finger is hovering over a key labeled smite. The first two things suggested by Larson's interpretation of the way God determines our fate is that God is impersonal and inaccessible. A God with his finger over the smite or destroy key is no more personally involved with the man whose fate rests with the punching of a computer key than decisions one of our teenagers make while playing Assassin's Creed or Call of Duty on his or her PS4 or Xbox. Second, God appears arbitrary and impulsive. Shall I choose to squash this guy or spare him? Hmm. What kind of a day am I having? What kind of mood am I in? That's exactly what's happening in today's scripture. The book of Job is one of the oldest writings in the Bible. It wrestles with the questions many are talking about in today's world. Why? Why me? Why them? Why my family? Why my country? Why my marriage? Why my community? Why did some along Texas's Gulf Coast lose everything? 
Why did our church in Mesia get leveled not long after our team worshiped twice and then left? I'm still filled with some guilt about it. My daughter was with me. Our team drove off leaving friends, our Methodist congregation behind, not knowing what would happen. Why did some of the most impoverished people in Eastern Europe, and there's much poverty there, lose everything? Why? Why did six million Jews die in the Holocaust? And it's not limited to our time. Why were all the babies in Bethlehem lost when Herod wanted them done away with to make certain that Jesus, the coming Messiah, couldn't survive? Why? And even Jesus wasn't spared. In despair, he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The book of Job deals with the details of the life of a man that the book's named after. He's presented as the richest man in the Middle East, a man of tremendous faith. He's blameless and upright, a man who feared God and shunned evil. That's what the Bible says about him. As the book opens, Job is the subject of a conversation between God and Satan. Satan in the story acts as the prosecuting attorney. Where have you been, God says to Satan. Oh, I've been checking things out down there on earth. And while you were there, says God, did you check out my main man, Job? He's incredibly faithful. Well, of course he's faithful, says Satan. Why wouldn't he be? He has everything. Actually, God, you've built a force field around him, protecting him, making sure that nothing bad can ever happen to him. If the force field came down, he would crumble. Let's see what would happen, God, if you took the force field down. Were that to happen, Job would end up cursing you, no matter how good you think you are. So the two strike this strange deal. God allows everything to be taken away from Job. His children who all die in what seems to be an accident, his flocks, his barns, his everything. But all the while, Job remains stoic and philosophical. I came naked from my mother's womb into this world, and I will be stripped of everything when I die, he says. So what's the deal? The Lord gave me everything I had, and the Lord has now taken it away. Praise the name of the Lord. Job's response is amazing. I've still got something, he says. I could, it could be worse. And it gets worse. He's stricken with a hideous skin disease so that hundreds of painful sores drip liquid really pus all day from his body. Things are so bad that Job's wife says, Job, go on and curse God and get over it. Get over with it and die. But Job will not. I hate my life, he says, but I will not complain to God. And then even Job's wife is taken. Still, he won't complain, but Job is not happy. He believes in God's justice. He only believes he's gotten more of the bad things in life that he deserves. Job wants his day in court. God would give me a fair hearing, he says. Fair and honest people can reason with God. Were I to have that chance, I would be acquitted by God. I I go to the east, he's not there. I go to the west and can't find him. I look for him in the north and he's hidden and in the south but cannot find him. However, I am sure he knows all about me. I have been tested like gold in the fire and I'm sure I am still innocent. Well, you've been there sometime, haven't you? Feeling that if God exists, he can't be found. The words, oh, that I knew where I might find him, have been our words. At home, sometimes I misplace things, and I must tell you I'm impatient until I find them. Job was anything but impatient. So could it be that he was looking for God in the wrong places? Could that be our problem? If you had been told that you are to meet someone at the airport who will be wearing a blue suit and will be hatless and bald, but instead find out later that he was wearing shorts and a t-shirt and a Braves cap, you certainly would have missed him. Could it be that you and I at times look for the wrong kind of God? 
Job was looking for a God who would make things right in this world, rewarding the good and punishing the wicked. And in his misery, there was evidence of no such kind of God. Maybe we here today in the church are looking for the wrong kind of God. A God who gives us everything we desire. A God who, when on the clock, protects us with a force field from any kind of danger or suffering. A God who rewards the good and punishes the bad with this world's riches. But that's not the God presented in the Bible. Job sought that kind of God because he thought he had been unjustly treated. Certainly, he thought, God will arrive with an account book in hand. And you know what? Job missed God completely. Maybe you and I look for the wrong kind of God. And maybe we're looking for God in the wrong places. Job said, I will look for God on the outside of things. If the storm strikes the house of the good man and passes by the house of the bad, then I will know there is no God. So where can God be found? Our story is different from that of Job as we have God's new revelation in Jesus. And the story of Jesus is not a story of a God who hovers over a smite key. It's not the story of a keeper of ledgers ready to punish any person who accrues debt. No, the story of Jesus is the story of a God who is in debtor's prison in place of us and all who are up to our necks in debt with no way out. The story of Jesus is not the story of a grim reaper or of a God with mind stamped on every beautiful sky or shouted at every powerful wind as if he were a seagull in Disney's Finding Nemo. Mine, mine, mine. The story of Jesus is the story of a God of love who came into our world in great humility, a God who was born on a pile of hay with the smells of animals lingering, a God who lived among peasants, a God who was murdered unjustly after sitting in court without appropriate legal representation, a God who was then crucified on a tree as one of the lowest criminals. And that's the reason we miss him. The world says God and thinks of shiny jewels and earth-shaking Wagner symphonies and fire. And most times that's exactly where God is not. Russian literary giant Leo Tolstoy knew all about looking for God. Most of his life was spent with a dominating feeling of depression and despair. After completing the major works, War and Peace and Anna Karenina, still Tolstoy had not found God. Because of his lack of faith, the Russian Orthodox Church excommunicated him. And then, and only then, he was led to write a story. In a certain town, he wrote, there lived an honest shoemaker named Martin. The shoemaker lived in a tiny basement apartment. All he could see out of his apartment were people's feet, but he knew whose feet they were because he had made all their shoes. But Martin's life had been filled with pain. First, his wife died, leaving him alone to raise their son. And no sooner had his son grown old enough to help his father, his son died as well. And then Martin gave into a life of despair. Two, he gave up any belief in God. But one day an old friend visited. Martin poured out his soul to him. The friend suggested that Martin, uh, the shoemaker, might begin to read the scriptures again. Surprisingly, he did, first on Sundays, but then on every day. And slowly his life began to change. He found that Christ's words from the Gospels brought him hope. And one night as he was reading, he thought he heard someone calling him. Listening attentively, he heard the words, Martin, Martin, look into the street tomorrow before I will come to visit you. He could see no one in his tiny apartment. He thought it was the voice of Jesus. So with great excitement, he sat down to repair shoes the next day. And as he did, he kept an eye on the window. But nothing exciting happened, not one thing. Oh, there was an old soldier by the name of Stephen clearing snow in the street and a woman with a baby in her arms leaning on the windowsill 
Martin motioned for them to come in in the warmth and enjoy some tea. But again, in the afternoon, there was nothing, nothing. Oh, there was the poor apple woman from down the street. With his own eyes, Martin saw the little poor boy from down the street run up, snatch an apple, and go running off, only to be caught by the screaming woman. Martin ran outside. The only thing he could do was to pay the woman for the apple and then kneel in the snow with his arms around the little boy. Through tears, the boy made an apology and then offered to carry the woman's wood for her. The day had been eventful, but there was certainly no Jesus The shoemaker went back in, took off his coat, and sat down to read as he often did in his hour of twilight. Tolstoy records that the Gospels fell open to a passage the shoemaker had read so often, I was hungry and you gave me meat. And the shoemaker glanced up through his spectacles in the dark and lonely room and smiled. Look for me tomorrow, the voice had said, for I will surely come. When Tolstoy completed the story, the author, who had almost become an atheist, chose to title it, Where Love Is, There God Is Also. The Russian literary giant had spent most of his life depressed and discouraged, but he was able to, he did find God. And about his pilgrimage, he wrote, Where Love Is, There God is also. But that's not all of the story for us. People of God who have been blessed by his presence must add, where love is not, we are called to make the appropriate appropriate sacrifices going out of our way to put God there. That's what the community of this congregation did in serving others through our Haiti and Mission attic sale. Where is God? Well, right here, of course, among us and across the world, pouring himself into those who need him the most, in and through the lives of those who serve him. May God be found with you and among us, and through us among his people all over the world. Would you bow with me? Lord of all, who knows when a sparrow falls from the sky and hears the cries of his people. May we be filled with appropriate faith in you, remembering that we are children of the only God, called to accept your love and to share it in a broken world. This prayer we ask in the name of Jesus the Christ, our Lord, Savior, friend, and brother. Amen.